Hello, everyone. I am Lenore Blum. Today, Manuel and I will talk about our recent work on consciousness, which we claim has implications for machine learning and AI. The quest to understand consciousness, once the purview of philosophers and theologians, is now actively pursued by scientists of many stripes. We are looking at consciousness through a theoretical computer science lens. Theoretical computer science is concerned with understanding the underlying principles of computation and complexity, especially the consequences and unexpected usefulness of resource limitations. It informs our model design and it has provided new insights, concepts and ingenious applications for example, to the fast generation of pseudo-random number sequences, infeasibly distinguishable from truly random. I will start with an overview of the conscious Turing machine, the CTM, and give several examples of phenomena generally associated with consciousness. Manuel will then discuss feelings of consciousness, free will, and pain in the conscious Turing machine. The conscious Turing machine is inspired in part by Alan Turing's simple yet powerful model of computation. And here we have a 23 state universal Turing machine that can compute any computable function. In other words, what you can compute in the cloud or in a supercomputer can be computed in this machine. On the other hand, you can get your head around this universal Turing machine. You can prove what it can compute, what it cannot compute much harder to do in the supercomputer or on the cloud. The conscious Turing machine is also inspired by Bernard Barr's global workspace theory of consciousness. And Barr's describes conscious awareness through a theater analogy. Consciousness is the activity of the actors in a play performing on a stage of working or short-term memory. The inner speech actor is often on stage. Their performance is under observation by a huge audience of unconscious processes and long-term memory that are sitting in the dark. Maybe this has happened to you once or twice. It certainly happened to me. You're at a party, you see somebody you know, but for the life of you, you can't remember her name. But then a half hour later, when you're home, her name pops up. It's Tina, oh my gosh, too late what's going on. So what happens is you recall where you first met, perhaps in a computer science class, and that goes up to short-term memory, which gets broadcast down to all your long-term memory processors. Then you recall, or one of your processes recalls something about what she does. Of course, she's in machine learning. That goes up to short-term memory and it gets broadcast down. Her name begins with S. Maybe another says, no, no, her name begins with T. These get broadcast in turn. A half hour later, her name comes up to the stage from the audience, which has been thinking, searching. The conscious self on stage doesn't know how or where her name was found. Here's another well-known example. Henri Poincaré, a famous mathematician, was working on a really tough math problem day and night, day and night, uh, not getting any sleep, not getting anywhere. And as he says, luckily, um, a friend of his invited him on a hiking vacation. And this is what happened. As I was about to board a bus, the idea came to me without anything in my former thoughts seeming to have paved the way for it that the transformations I had used to define the Fuchsian functions were identical with those of non-Euclidean geometry. In other words, there were these two areas of mathematics that Poincaré knew very well, but he had never seen the connection before. But then as he was about to board the bus, the idea came to him that they were isomorphic. What's going on? Getting back to Bars's global workspace theory, here on the lower right, we have his sketch of the global workspace. In the center, there is a working storage, that's the stage. And down below is enormous collection of long-term memory processors, that's the audience. And here on top, we have the central executive, maybe the stage manager, the drama director. And on the left, we have input coming from the outside world through sensors to working storage. And on the right, we have output going from working storage through actuators to the outside world. 
Before going ahead, I'd like to make two points. The first one being that the conscious Turing machine is not a model of the brain, nor of neural correlates of consciousness, nor of cognition. It's way too simple for that. It considers the brain at a very, very high level of abstraction at levels well above that of neurons and neuronal activity. After defining the CTM, we define consciousness in the CTM, then point out properties of consciousness in the conscious Turing machine. We derive from the model high level explanations of phenomena generally associated with consciousness. And these include pain, pleasure, blindsight, inattentional blindness, change blindness, dreams, free will, altered states. And these are in our papers. In these talks, Manuel and I will just discuss the ones indicated in red here. The second point is that the CTM, the conscious Turing machine, is not a standard Turing machine. It's not the input output map or computing power that gives the CTM the feeling of consciousness, but rather what's under its hood. And what's under its hood is to start with the global workspace architecture, plus something we call predictive dynamics. And these are cycles of prediction, feedback, and learning that are happening throughout the conscious Turing machine. And then importantly, some several key processes, for example, inner speech processor and model of the world processor that communicate in a rich multimodal inner language, which we call brainish, plus motivation and some minimal cognitive ability. So the conscious Turing machine is defined as a seven tuple, STM, LTM, input, output, up tree, down tree, and links. And coincidentally, the Turing machine is often defined as a seven tuple. And here's a sketch of the CTM. We start with a tiny short-term memory. It's a read-write memory. That's our stage. And the stage can hold only one chunk of information. Now, this is not the seven plus or minus two chunks that George Miller talks about in the 50s, but since we can get away with one chunk and we're looking for some simplicity, one chunk will do. Then we have an enormous collection of long-term memory processors. They are parallel and powerful. Uh, and at some point, some of them will become connected. This is our audience. The CTM also has input and output maps. The input map is coming from the external world through sensors like eyes and ears going to long-term memory processors. And at the same time, the language of the outside world, worldish, is translated into brainish. Brainish is the inner language used by the processors in the conscious Turing machine to communicate with each other. It is a multimodal language used to express inner speech, inner vision, and inner sensations in words and phrases called gist. Brainish is richer and more expressive than outer languages. It is being developed by Paul Liang, a PhD student in machine learning at Carnegie Mellon. Having an expressive inner language is an important component of the feeling of consciousness. At the same time, we have output maps going from long-term memory processors through actuators to the outside world. And of course, brainish then is translated into worldish. Several points. For one, the input output maps go directly to and from the long-term memory process, not through short-term memory as in Bars's sketch. And this is informed in part by neuroscience and in part because we want the stage, the short-term memory to be just a holder of a single chunk of information. We have no stage manager. Again, we can get away with it, not having a stage manager. And since we are looking for simplicity, no stage manager. We now come to the uptree, which is the conduit for the competition for the long-term memory processors to get their information up on the stage into short-term memory. And the way this is done is at each moment of time, each processor puts a chunk into the competition. Now, what a chunk is for us formally is a six tuple. And the chunk that processor P puts in at time T consists first of all of its address. And if we have a 10 to the seventh processors, more or less like 10 to the seven cortical columns in the brain, the address is just a seven digit number. 
Then the next component is the time the chunk is entered into the competition. And then more importantly, the next thing is the gist. That's the information. It's a query, an answer to a query, a news item, or some very important fact that the processor wants to get into short-term memory. Next, we have the weight. And the weight is the valence measure, valence value that the processor has given to its gist. And the last two components, intensity starts off as absolute value weight and mood starts off as weight. And as the chunk moves up the competition winning at locally, the first four components will stay the same, the last two will change. So let me give you an example of how this might work. So what I'm only doing is giving you two components of the chunk as it's going up. I'm showing you a little bit of information about the gist and also the current mood. And in this particular competition, I've chosen a competition function where f of the current chunk is the absolute value of the current mood. And the chunk will move up depending upon the f value, with it, the larger f value here. So here in the middle, for example, we have pain versus joy. Pain has mood of minus five, which is absolute value greater than three. So pain will move up according to this competition function. And then we have the new mood is the sum of the two moods here, minus five plus three is minus two. Makes a little bit of sense. If you have pain, but some joy comes in, maybe the pain will go down. And then again, here, we're gonna have a uh, pain competing with fear. Fear actually is gonna win out because it has a larger absolute value of its mood, it moves up. And the new mood is minus two plus or minus five, which is minus seven. Again, makes a little bit of sense if you have fear and then some pain, the fear might be more exacerbated. A couple of things to notice. For one, the chunk size is relatively small. The gist is a compact, succinct amount of information. The competition function that we have here is relatively fast. Now, even though we are not gonna use this particular function going forward, as we shall see, the functions that we choose are also relatively fast. Now, all of this is important for complexity considerations. For many reasons, a couple of which we shall soon see, we prefer the probabilistic CTM. Now, the probabilistic CTM is identical to the deterministic CTM, except for the competition uptree. And here at each competition node, we insert a coin flip neuron. And what the coin flip neuron does is, rather than just for having the chunk move up according to the larger F value, it will be the probability of the larger F value. And if f is any additive competition function, then for all processors p and time t, the probability that p wins the competition that began at time t is f of the chunk that the processor p put in at time t over the sum of the f values of each of the chunks that were put in at time t. And this has the very nice property that chunks get into short-term memory in proportion to their importance with respect to F value and probability, and hence independent of the submitting processor location. Now, the earlier F function that I gave, competition function that I gave, the absolute value of the mood is not an additive competition function. And it also has a very bad property that you may have noticed if we rotated or permuted the processors around, we might get a very, very different outcome to the winner of the competition. Another nice property of additive competition functions is that chunks, even with very low value, have some chance of getting into short-term memory onto the stage. Additive competition functions have the form intensity plus x times mood, where x ranges between minus one and plus one. We say that the CTM is level-headed if X is zero, optimistic if X is greater than zero, pessimistic if X is negative. And at the extremes, we say the CTM is manic if X is plus one, depressed if X is minus one. These are definitions. As soon as a chunk gets into short-term memory, it is immediately broadcast via the down tree to all long-term memory processors. This is a very fast broadcast. 
And now we can start to see some of the dynamics. One might think of when the processors put chunks into the competition, those are some of their predictions. And now via the broadcast, they have gotten some feedback. What to do? Well, all of the long-term memory processors have Alvin Blum's sleeping experts algorithms. These algorithms help to balance things out. So for example, maybe we have a processor that's very egotistical and gives very, very high value to its chunks, uh, but maybe it's wrong. Remember in what's your name? There was a processor who said her name started with S. Well, soon found out that her name started with T. So what the sleeping experts algorithm will do will for that processor, help it to lower the value of its chunks. Conversely, there might be a processor that's very astute, very intelligent, but sort of humble and gives too low value to its chunks, but they're correct. After a while, the sleeping experts algorithms will help them boost the values they give to their chunks. This dynamic also plays out when processors give predictions that go to the outside world and they get feedback from the outside world. We call this process predictive dynamics, the cycle of prediction, feedback, and learning throughout the CTM. Let's see some of the CTM dynamics. First, we will have some input coming from the outside world, perhaps through eyes and ears, and perhaps there's a very ferocious bull out there and the fear processor responds very strongly by giving a very, very high value to its chunk, which then wins the competition. That chunk is immediately broadcast to all long-term processors and the inner speech or the speech processor will send a signal to the outside world. Now, long-term memory processor A, fear in this case, will link up to B, inner speech, inner speech in this case, when B answers A's call. And this is like the Hebbian principle that neurons that fire together, wire together. And over time, more and more of these links will form between perhaps fear and inner speech that will become stronger between other processors as well. And so also importantly, linking now will enable conscious processing to become unconscious. And this is what happened to Poincaré when his long-term memory processors were working furiously to finally see that those two theories were isomorphic when we finally remembered her name, Tina. Now we have sketched all the components of the CTM and we're ready to give definitions of consciousness in the CTM. We say that the chunk in the short-term memory is the conscious content of the conscious Turing machine and consciousness in the conscious Turing machine is the awareness, in other words, the reception by all long-term memory processors of the conscious content of CTM. The constant activity of chunks competing to get into short-term memory and then broadcast to long-term memory creates a stream of consciousness. But these are just definitions. The reasonableness of our definitions of consciousness will lie in the number of concepts that the model explains easily and naturally, at least at the high level. At the high level, we consider phenomena generally associated with consciousness. So I'll do blind sight and intentional blindness and change blindness, and then we'll, we'll look into free will. I'll start with blind sight. Here we have a very cluttered li living room. It's like an obstacle course. And we have this gentleman sitting on the right-hand side on the couch, and he's asked to go to the other room. Perhaps food is being served. He says, but I can't see. Nevertheless, he gets up, walks to the door, avoiding all the obstacles. What's going on? Here's a very high level CTM explanation. And we have the vision processor, which seems to be working pretty well, actually. There's input coming in from the eye and perhaps through other processors from the ear and so forth. And the vision processor sends messages to the walk actuator and he walks across the room. But perhaps the link from vision to short-term memory is either broken or non-existent. And without the connection from vision to short-term memory, he has no conscious sense that he can see. Nothing's getting up to short-term memory or very little. It's not getting broadcast down. So he's not consciously aware. At the high level, this explanation is consistent with explanations of blind sight in humans, given, for example, in the neuroscience literature. 
Next, we have the example of inintentional blindness in the CTM. And here we have a film, perhaps you've seen it. In this film, there are white-shirted players and black-shirted players, and the players are passing a volleyball around and they're asked, the viewers are asked to count how many times white-shirted players pass the ball. And most people seem to get it okay, 15. But did you see the gorilla? Did the CTM see the gorilla? And here's the gorilla in plain sight. What's going on? When we are given a task to look for, when the CTM is given a task to look for, higher weights are given to that task, and we are not conscious of other things in the picture that now have lower weights. And again, this explanation at a very high level is consistent with some of the neuroscience literature and some of the psychological literature as well. Final example now is change blindness in the conscious Turing machine. And again, maybe you've seen this film before. We have a detective who comes into the room and sees a dead guy on the floor. And he says, clearly somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe. Each of you tell me your whereabouts. And the maid says, I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. And the butler says, I was buttering his lordship's scones. And Lady Smythe says, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. And of course, the clever detective says, constable arrest Lady Smythe. Okay, but for us, there's a bigger mystery here. How come we did not notice, or well, the CTM did not notice that the detective changed his coat from a dark color to a light color? The flowers changed completely. And in fact, the dead guy on the floor changed his clothes and now his, one of his legs is up in the air and there is a zillion other changes that happened. What's going on? Why didn't the CTM, why didn't we see the many changes? Detecting change in the whodunit video would have required significant changes in the gist describing the beginning and ending scenes, but size limitations on conscious content and the clever scene transitions caused the high level descriptions to be essentially the same. So the same gist describes the beginning scene and the end scene. The scene is the living room of a mansion with a butler maid and detective and a man laid out on the floor. Again, uh, the CTM explanation is consistent with literature on change blindness in humans. To review the high level CTM explanations, in blindsight, the explanation was that the path from the vision processor to short term memory was either non existent or broken. The inintentional blindness, not seeing the gorilla, was because we gave higher weight or higher value to what we were looking for and lower weight, lower value to what we were not paying attention to. And in change blindness, the high level explanation was we used the same gist to describe the first scene and the last scene. So we did not notice all the many changes. We have already seen some confirmation of the conscious Turing machine high level explanations in the literature on human consciousness. This has come from cognitive psychology and also from the literature on neural correlates. In particular, I'd like to mention the paper Conscious Processing and the Global Neuronal Workspace Hypothesis, where they look at the concepts of conscious content, global broadcast, conscious awareness, and stream of consciousness in the human brain. And finally, I'd like to mention some confirmation coming from recent developments in evolutionary biology. And I mentioned particularly a recent book by Simona Ginsberg and Eva Jablanka that were looking at the evolution of consciousness. And they go through five transition periods. We see the CTM maybe in their transition three, perhaps even their transition four. So what might be the implications of the CTM for machine learning and AI? Let me give you one example. The CTM provides high level stories. To each long term memory processor, P stores in its internal memory the sequence of tuples ordered by time, T, consisting of the chunk that it submitted to the competition or elsewhere, and all chunks it received at time, T, whether by broadcast from SVM, short term memory, from links, or from input maps. These sequences comprise the conscious Turing machine's memories. And with this history, the conscious Turing machine can provide a high level story of what it saw and did and even why. 
We have a couple of papers out. One is in the Journal of AI and Consciousness. The second one is in, right now in archive. So thank you very much. And then we'll discuss feelings of consciousness, free will, and pain in the CTM. Thank you, Lenore. This is now part two of our talk. It's a classical non-quantum explanation for feelings in the probabilistic CTM, specifically the feelings of consciousness, free will, and pain. So what makes you feel conscious? What gives you, a human, your feeling of consciousness? For example, do you hear a voice in your head? Do you hear yourself talking to yourself? Can you picture yourself in your mind's eye waking up in the morning? Do you remember yourself as a child trying to do the impossible, like using the magical power of thought to close a door or turn on a light? In answering these questions, you tap into your feeling of consciousness. Can the CTM tap into something like that? What might enable a robot with CTM brain to feel conscious? LTM processors essential for consciousness include, first, inner speech processors for transforming brainish thoughts in STM into something akin to outer speech. Although that could be vision or tactile sensation, something like that. CTM needs to do this for commenting, planning, etc. LTM processors essential for consciousness also include a model of the world processor for maintaining labeled models of the world. The labels have many purposes. The one especially interested in here is the ability to distinguish self from not self. For instance, you move a leg with the power of thought by moving the leg in that model of the world. Here you see a baby discovering its left leg. Pretty wonderful. <laughs> got control over its left leg, it'll look over to its right leg to see if it can do that, but that they can't do that, at least not yet. The third thing that one needs essential for consciousness is some minimal ability to think, including the motivation, energy, and drive to do it. In more detail about the inner speech processor, more generally, inner speech can be any inner thought or what the senses take in when awake or dreaming. Those senses are outer senses, such as the ears, eyes, and fingers on the world, or it could be inner senses, such as the mind's ears, mind's eyes, mind's fingers, mind's stomach. These are the senses of the CTM in your model of the world. All thoughts and sensations are in brainish, the language of the brain. Brainish words are gis. Gis are multimodal sounds, images, tactile sensations, tastes, odors, and so on. Brainish gis describe all that we're aware of, awake or dreaming. So in more detail again, the model of the world processor maintains labeled models of the world, as we said. The labels stamp the CTM in those worlds as being CTM. They label the CTM in those models as conscious to distinguish all that CTM has direct power of thought control over from what it has only indirect or no control. Here you see Yoda able to move this rock up and down. If Yoda's brain is a CTM, then Yoda is conscious of the rock as self. And that's because it can move the rock up and down and it's model of the world, and it sees that that actually moves the rock out there in the world. Why would a robot with a CTM brain feel conscious? Looking at the CTM from the viewpoint of the outside world, we see that something about CTM is conscious. Specifically, the CTM considers itself conscious. What is conscious cannot be the model of the world processor or any other processor as processors have no feelings. They are just machines running algorithms. We propose the view that CTM as a whole feels conscious as it is normally understood 
as a consequence in part of the fact that the model of the world processor views the CTM and its models of the world as conscious and that this view is broadcast to all processors. I'll repeat that. We propose the view that CTM as a whole feels conscious as it is normally understood as a consequence in part of the fact that the model of the world processor views the CTM in its models of the world as conscious and that this view is broadcast to all processors. That's it for consciousness. And now for free will. The paradox of free will is captured by Dr. Samuel Johnson's observation from Boswell. All theory is against the freedom of the will. All experience is for it. Stan Dehain bestows a contemporary voice. Our brain states are clearly not uncaused and do not escape the laws of physics. Nothing does. But our decisions are genuinely free whenever they are based on a conscious deliberation that proceeds autonomously without any impediment, carefully weighing the pros and cons before committing to a course of action. When this occurs, we are correct in speaking of a voluntary decision, even if it is, of course, ultimately caused by our genes. We add to Dehain, computation takes time. To make a decision, a CTM evaluates its alternatives, an evaluation that takes time. And during that time, the CTM is free, indeed may even feel free, to choose whichever outcome it deems best. What gives CTM the knowledge that it has free will? Consider a moment in chess when the CTM asks itself, what move should I make? meaning this question has risen to STM and through broadcast has reached the audience of LTM processors. In response, a number of those processors submit suggestions to the competition. The winner of the competition reaches STM and gets broadcast. The continued back and forth sequence of questions, suggestions, and answers that appear in STM, each broadcast globally to all LTM, gives CTM knowledge of its control. The episodic memory processor stored that knowledge. If the CTM were asked how it generated a specific suggestion, i.e. what thinking went into making that suggestion, its inner speech processor would be able to articulate the fraction of conversation that reached STM, though perhaps not much more. Why does the CTM feel that it has free will? Many LTM processors compete to produce the CTM's final decision, but CTM is only consciously aware of what got into STM, which is not all that was submitted to the competition. Moreover, much of CTM, meaning most of its processors, are not privy to the unconscious chatter among processors. To the CTM, enough is consciously unknown about the process that the decision can appear at times to be plucked from thin air. Even so, although CTM does not consciously know how its suggestions were arrived at, except for what is in the high level broad strokes broadcast by SDM, it knows that its suggestions came from inside itself. The CTM can rightly take credit for making its suggestions. After all, they did come from inside the CTM, can explain some of them with high level stories from its episodic memory. And as for what it cannot explain, it can say, I don't know, or I don't remember. It is the knowledge that there are choices that it, the CTM has knowledge of those choices and ignorance as well, that generates the feeling of free will. That's it. We now focus on another aspect of consciousness, namely pain. We would especially like to understand what might generate feelings of pain and pleasure. The agony of pain and the ecstasy of joy beg for an explanation, if only because they are such a puzzle the puzzle is that a mechanism, the body, is able to generate these feelings. 
How does it do that? To understand the problem, consider the disorder of pain asymbolia. After a bump on the head, a person can become pain asymbolic, meaning they don't suffer from the feeling of pain. They know what pain is from their experience of it before they got the bump, but they don't suffer from the feeling of pain. Pain as symbolic people can be burned, frozen, smashed, cut. All these things cause pain, but not suffering. Pain as symbolics claim to still have the pain. They clearly know where and what kind it is, how hot or cold, and that it is pain but say it's okay. So what's different in the pain as symbolic's head? How might a robot with a CTM brain feel pain? Look at it this way. Today's robots are pain as symbolic. We want to know what is missing in a robot's brain. What could make it feel pain as humans feel it? But first, why should robots suffer anyway? First, for the same reason animals must suffer, animals born without the suffering of pain don't live long. And secondly, because we want robots to have empathy. Humans find it hard to understand a feeling if they have never had that feeling. Okay? And second, why are we so taken by this question? First, because it is a hard problem. To our mind, the hardest of the hard problems. Second, because pain is clearly not an illusion. Maybe the color red is an illusion, but pain, you cannot convince me that pain is an illusion. And third, because it is mighty hard to understand how a machine could really feel pain. How might a robot with a CTM brain feel pain? We have three suggestions for extreme pain, only three. First is broadcasts. Extreme pain is an actor that takes over all short-term memory. It prevents all other actors from reaching the stage. Pain messages and only pain messages are broadcast. Every processor knows of the pain, Every processor is programmed to reduce pain's intensity if it can do so. With few exceptions, nothing else can get to SDM. And confirmation, under conditions that normally cause agony, pain as symbolics can think while normals cannot. And in a Darwinian design, you might expect pain to lead to constructive thinking but agony actually interferes with constructive thinking. What? How does this help? For one, it forces you to rely on your unconscious self. How might a robot with a CTM brain feel pain? Interrupts, sudden extreme pain, a finger touching a burning stove, interrupts all unconscious processors. Interrupts, as opposed to broadcasts, cause processors to instantly put their work on a stack, forces them to pay their maximum immediate attention to the interrupt. Interrupts differ from broadcasts, which send their information to processors without forcing them to put what they're doing on a stack. And third, brainish, the multimodal language that processors use to communicate among themselves. Processors can scream pain, pain. Their screams can join multimodal dialects. How are these ideas to be checked? For example, we would consider ourselves on the right track if these ideas could be used to give us, say, the superhuman ability to withstand great pain without anesthesia, such as the pain of a root canal. In the CTM, when pain is unbearable, not much else can get into STM. As a test, I asked my dentist to not give me no Novocaine. Yet, when his drill touched my nerve, I could still think to stop it. I could and did scream, stop. Wow, 
This means something else could get into STM despite the pain. In the deterministic CTM, nothing else gets in. This is a failure of the model. However, in the probabilistic CTM, other chunks can and do get into STM. They get in for a fraction of time proportional to their importance. In any case, I was not able to stop the pain. Understanding pain in the CTM did not give me the ability to withstand great pain without anesthesia. Sad. On the positive side, the CTM did give me a sense of why I cannot stop the pain. Aha. Uh -huh. I have a footnote here explaining why. Let's blow that up. Unbearable pain in STM does not let anything else into STM unless it too has great weight. Unbearable pain demands that processors do whatever they can do to try and kill the pain. In the case of a root canal, there is one idea that gets sufficient weight to enter STM because it can instantly solve the problem of stopping the pain, and that is to cry out, stop. Insights from the CTM. Why is STM so tiny? Folks who consider building a CTM typically begin by making, by suggesting making STM big. Memory is cheap, so why not make STM big? The answer is so that all processors focus on the same thought. You know, the other extreme would be that every processor has its own space in STM for its chunk. In that case, there would be as many chunks in STM as there are processors, and it would be very difficult for processors to focus. In fact, the whole purpose of the uptree is to find the chunk or chunks on which to focus. What are GIS and why are they important? GIS are all that we know of the world. To understand what exactly a GIS can be, Think of the multimodal gist that make up a dream. Gists are the frames woven together to create a multimodal movie dream. Why is consciousness of a chunk defined by the reception of its broadcast? In other words, why does reception of a chunk give the feeling of consciousness? In part, it's because all processors receive that chunk. Sleep, what's it for? Lisp machines typically use sleep for garbage collection. The CTM does that as well. Dreams, who or what creates and controls the dream scene as if it were created by the outside world? The answer is that any processor can take on the role of dream generator, setting up and maintaining the dream scene who or what responds to the created scene? All processors respond. They respond to the dream scene as they would to the outside world. What is meditation doing? The meditation processor builds up its own weight by paying massive attention to itself. And by comparison, lowering the weight of every other processor. Developing this massive weight incidentally seems to require a massive amount of practice. How does hypnosis work? Like meditation, it focuses attention. And that's the end of this talk. Thank you.